I worked on this for months. At first glance, it might look like a heavily botched SSD. But wait, what is this? Yeah, you guessed it. It's a 160 core RISC-V supercluster. What can it actually do? Oh yeah! <laughs> and how did building it nearly break me? Some strange state. Find out in today's episode. I don't know how this should ever work with 160 cores. This project technically started a few years ago, when I built a 256 core mega cluster. That were my first four layer PCBs, and a serious challenge. I tried to cram 16 MCUs onto a tiny module. Here's the result. A 4x4 cm board packed with traces across all layers. What I didn't like? The densely packed surface mount pin headers. They bend easily, are expensive and make the assembly a pain. Back then the CH32003 chip was only available in a small SOP package with tiny legs. So that size was as compact as it could get. Soon after they released a smaller QFN version of the same chip. Still 48 MHz, 2 KB SRAM and 16 KB flash. I tried a new design but never made a video about it. From that point on I knew next time I'm going to use edge connectors. They are cheap and dense, especially the ones with a 0.5mm pin pitch, like those in M.2 form factors. This year I finally revisited the idea. I fell in love with the possibilities offered by M.2's exposed PCI Express lanes. I had tested the idea with my last M.2 matrix project using a PCI Express serial interface chip. Serial is easy to access from the browser thanks to web serial, so I reused that interface and placed it on the bottom side of my board. But instead of jamming 32 MCUs on the top, I had a different idea. 10 vertical M.2 slots, each with its own modular board of MCUs. Each module could have a different configuration if needed. Spoiler, that turned out to be a terrible idea for many reasons, but more on that in a bit. I started laying out the modules. The goal? Root bus, IOs and power within a standard PCB budget. Exceeding those specs makes the manufacturing costs grow exponentially. In the end I squeezed everything onto a 4 layer PCB. 64 components, 515 pads, 413 vias and countless 100 micrometer traces as thin as a human hair. After days of iteration I got it down to 22 by 26 mm. And it looks amazing! About a quarter of the size of my old design. The 22 mm width fulfills the M.2 spec, but the final height of the cluster is probably not. Unfortunately this complexity added some cost. Each module comes at about 15 bucks when ordering a batch of 20. But honestly, totally worth it. Now, these modules aren't pin compatible with the M.2 interface. They just use the same physical connector. So I planned to use vertical connectors and this is where the real trouble began. JLC would be only able to source entire reels of this and that would cost 500 bucks. I ended up finding a seller on Aliexpress who offered them individually for a few bucks each. Which meant, yep, manual assembly. Piece of cake? Not quite. I... I usually refill one side of the board, then solder the other by hand. With minor success, many pins didn't make contact and I had to retouch them all. But here the pins on the vertical connectors were completely unreachable. Who designed this? Eventually I wrapped a 1mm wire around my soldering iron tip to sneak between the connectors. This was finicky, but it worked. You might have noticed some chips are missing. And there is a whole story to that. You have to rewind the time. Before I started with the cluster board, I made a programmer board to flash individual MCUs by powering them one at a time as they are sharing the programming pin. Okay, let's plug it in. I hope I, hope I didn't mirror the pins or whatever. I thought low side power switching would be a good choice. Did it crash? It wasn't. Even though the MCUs had individual grounds, they were still connected via bus lines and shared reset lines. What happened? 
The current found a way, ah! likely through body diodes. MCUs started heating up randomly, but luckily none were permanently damaged. Some, some strange state. All grounds are connected now. So I had to power them all at once and try programming them together. I had done this before, and while it was tricky back then, yeah. this time it worked surprisingly Ooh. well. Ooh, all right. <laughs> Complicated design to make Let's Blink. Yeah. I wanted the host MCU to talk to all the 160 small ones individually over a single open drain bus without interrupting the rest. When I designed the programmer board first, I used the GPIO 0 pin as a trigger for the start of a packet. However, during the design of the cluster board, I changed my decision to another pin. But the programmer board was already ordered, so I botched it. Luckily, the GPIOs I freed up from the now defunct low side switches came to the rescue. I reused all 16 of those to make the programmer behave just like the cluster. Alright, here we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I pre-programmed each MCU with a fixed index in the option bytes that represents its physical position in the array. Now we could even use the whole thing as a 3D LED matrix. Or for debugging, we could identify which of the physical MCUs stopped responding. You know who else stopped responding? Me! To anonymous phone calls. My car warranty expired 20 years ago and I'm still not interested in extending it. If you're tired being spammed every single day, calls, emails, even physical mail, then today's sponsors Incogni is here to help. Now I make plenty of questionable decisions in my lab and I fully embrace them for your entertainment. But I'll admit I was sloppy with my personal data in the past. I filled out one of those sketchy winner car forms. I didn't win the car, but data brokers definitely won my info. Suddenly I was getting spammed from every direction. It got so bad I snapped at the real business caller thinking it was spam again. I'm still ashamed of that moment. And it's not just annoying. Some of these data brokers collect everything, email addresses, home address, work and financial history and resell it to advertisers, scammers and people search sites that expose it literally to anyone online. Incogni puts an end to that. They use data privacy laws to force over 230 data brokers to delete your data. You just sign up and they handle the rest. I tested it myself and honestly I was surprised. Within minutes of signing up they already had processed a bunch of removal requests and even started suppressing new ones before they could even access my info. There are multiple plans. The standard plan covers you with automated removals, monthly updates and 24-7 support. The family plan extends that up to four more people in your household. And the ultimate plan gives you custom removal requests from any data broker or site. It's risk-free to try for 30 days and cancel anytime. Take your personal data back with Incogni. Use code BITLOONY at the link below and get 60% off an annual plan. And now back to the project. Hacker mode activated. To show what the cluster is capable of, I implemented a ray marcher that was a rabbit hole on its own. Moment of truth. Hey, what? No! The plan? Render a scene with reflections and shadows distributed across all MCUs. Each MCU would take care of a pixel at a time. In the browser, this worked fine. Translating it to C++ for the MCUs? Way harder. These tiny RISC-V cores had a rudimentary instruction set. No floating point, no square root, not even integer multiplication or division. But with fixed point math, I got it working. I would say for one MCU, that's not bad. Kind of. It breaks when sending and only like four are working at the same time. I had each MCU light up its LED while rendering a pixel. But remember those hair thin traces? Too many LEDs at once caused brownouts. It died completely. No time out anymore? What? That took me a while to discover. I don't know how this should ever work with 160 cores. Uh oh. Oh no! I was using a 200 ohm LED resistor which drew too much current. So I switched the LED GPIOs from push-pull to using the internal pull-up instead. The LED lit up faintly, but the current draw was dramatically reduced and it solved so many issues I haven't even diagnosed yet. Now I uploaded the code without the blink. So here a LED timeout is off. Ping again. Is it connected? Ping. Bam, everything works. What? Oh, rendering error here. What we have done? <laughs> <laughs> this 
This is this is already too fast. This is real time. I can see in real time how the image is built. <laughs> Should we try this board with 160 MCUs at the same time? I never tried it though. Something was still off. Using more than one module caused the system to crash or reset. We lose like two cores at the end or even more. Sometimes the last three MCUs on each module wouldn't respond. That triggered a memory. GPIO C 13 to 15 are special, limited in speed and current. I had used them due to GPIO shortage. Big mistake. To fix it, I repurposed GPIOs from the old low side driver circuit that I didn't populate and replaced the problematic pins. Forging these is again another level. Okay, let's try the ping. Finally, for the first time, all 160 MCUs responded correctly. All green? Yes! <laughs> yeah. But did they perform? The Ray Marcher ran. But the colors were wrong. It was devastating. And we have some flipped bytes here. Or but shift. after some thought I realized the view vectors sent to the MCUs were correct. The scene geometry was fine, only the returned color data was corrupted. I used my debug tool to ping an MCU with extra data attached, testing each of the data lines. And sure enough, some bits wouldn't echo properly, specifically low to high side transitions. Here's the issue. I used an open drain bus where each GPIO can only pull low. There is an external pull up resistor to bring the signal high. This avoids shorts when multiple MCUs try talking at once. But the 10k pull ups were too weak for the megahertz signals. The signal rise time was too slow resulting in false lows. I tried 1 kilo ohm pull ups, but the already underpowered MCUs couldn't handle the current and stopped working entirely. Yeah, that's not working. My compromise? Add a delay on the host side to let the signal settle. That worked and all colors were now correct. <laughs> but still, I had two modules dropping out. After testing and swapping slots, I suspected bit solder joints. Touching up a few cold looking pins fixed the issue eventually. And finally the cluster was fully functional. Oh yeah! <laughs> Until this point, several times I wanted to give up. I'm glad I didn't. I guess solving those puzzles and going through this emotional roller coaster, a success is even more rewarding. But how successful is it? The Ray Marcher didn't look any faster than running on a single module. And that's because the serial port is the bottleneck. 115 kilobits per second. The interface chip should support up to 8 megabits. But I haven't been able to get it working yet. If anyone out there has figured this out, let me know. Until then, I can either increase the rendering complexity to utilize the MCUs more, or try compute-heavy low bandwidth tasks like hashing. So I built a SHA-256 hashing benchmark. SHA-256 is an algorithm that crypto miners use. Not that I support that waste of energy, but it's a good benchmark and it worked amazingly. The 160 MCUs combined actually outperformed my 8-core desktop CPU. At just 7 mA per core at 3.3 volts, the whole cluster draws under 4 watts. That's pretty competitive for the hash rate. So what do you think we should use it for? This project took way more time, effort and emotional energy than I expected. There were so many failures, but just as many lessons learned. I hope I was able to inspire you and maybe even teach a few things through my mistakes. You will find all the design files and code linked below. Just don't send the design to a fab before fixing it. If you appreciate this kind of content, consider subscribing or sharing with a friend. And thanks to my supporters, you have been incredibly patient waiting for signs of life. I see you next time. Bye.